All right. Good morning, Melinda. How are you doing today? Good morning, Chris. I'm great. How are you? I am amazing. I'm so glad we finally got to link up and discuss your awesome new book coming out. So, so real quick, uh, for you as well as the audience, like, and and I'm sure you have this experience too as a, as a mother, um, my son, like, I, I remember just, you know, questions going through my mind or other parents or other people, because I was one of the first people in my friend group to have a kid. They're like, what if your son is, you know, he grows up and he's gay? Or what if he has a different, like, political ideology than you do? Or what if, you know, this? What if that? And I always said, as long as my son is not an asshole, I will be totally fine. So when I saw the title of your book, how to raise kids who aren't assholes. I was like, well, I need this. And it was phenomenal. So, so tell, tell us what inspired you to write this book. Yes. Great question. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so I, around 2018, I was getting increasingly frustrated and worried about all of the bad behavior I was seeing around me, um, among, uh, politics and political figures. <laughs> and it was actually right around the time of the Kavanaugh hearings. And oh. I, oh boy. And I think Trump had just gone on national TV and he was mocking Christine Blasey Ford. And, mm -hmm. and I was, I was just, and I was thinking about the fact that, that my kids, I mean, we didn't have them watching a lot of news on TV or anything, but at the yeah. same time, you know, they were probably being exposed to some of this. They were probably hearing at school, some of what Trump was doing and saying. And I just, I started thinking, you know, gosh, more than anything else, what I want is to make sure my kids do not grow up to be assholes and basically yeah. like do not grow up to be Donald Trump. And, um, and I started thinking about it and I, I realized, you know, there, there might be some interesting research on this. I hadn't really mm. looked into it. I'm a science journalist and I write, I have written a lot about parenting in the past, but, um, but I hadn't really looked specifically into, you know, what do we know about what parenting practices shape kids' character and values? Mm. And I started looking into it and realized there's all sorts of great research. A lot of it hadn't been translated into to a lay audience. And, and then mm. I, I was talking to other parents too and, and realizing they were having the same realization that like more than anything else, they just wanted their kids to not grow up to be assholes. And, yeah. and so that was it. Like one night actually, I just had, it just actually the title of the book popped into my head. I was out to dinner with my husband and I was kind of like thinking, and it was right around the Kavanaugh hearings and I was kind of bummed out and I was like, oh, and then I just blurted out, I think I should write a book called How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes. Mm -hmm. And my husband looked at me and he was like, that's it. That's your book. Cause I've been <laughs> wanting to write a book for a long time. And I was like, Oh my God. And the next morning I emailed my agent and was like, I think I have my book. Nice. How, how long, how long were you working on it? How long did it all take to come together? Yeah, it took a while. Well, so that was in October of 2018 when I had the mm. idea for the book. And then it took a while, you know, it took like maybe four months to actually sell the book, to get a book proposal together and sell it um, to a publisher. And then gosh, that, yeah, that happened around like March of 2019, I guess. Mm. And then I spent a year writing it. I actually turned in the book on March 1st, 2020, right before the pandemic hit, which thank goodness, because if I hadn't, and I had, if I had had to have been working on it during the pandemic, I don't know that I would have finished it ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kids home. So thank goodness. Um, and then they kind of held it for a while throughout the pandemic because books were just not selling and they, 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 so the oh, publisher really? kind of I, I would it think more now. people were reading during the pandemic. I know, I know. I, I think, you know, I think there were a lot of people who were reading more, but for whatever reason, I was hearing that a lot of books just, they weren't selling very well. And of course they couldn't do like book tours and stuff, although you still can't really do book tours. So they just yeah. kind of held on to it till now. So that was the process. Yeah. So, so one of the things that, uh, I, I think it was even in the intro of the book, um, and you talked about how like when you were you were writing and you kind of had this like little internal, uh, you know, dialogue with yourself. And it's something I think about all the time about like, who am I to write about parenting and give other people advice? So how, how old are your kids, by the way? My son is 10 and my daughter's seven. Oh, okay. So our kids aren't too far apart. So my son, uh, I only have one, but my son is 12, right? And I look at him and I'm like, this kid's turning out pretty well, right? And I, I write, you know, and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, it'd be cool to kind of just like share my experience, you know, as as just like a recovering drug addict who got sober when he was three. And, you know, I was like, maybe I have some insight, but then I'm like, wait, who the hell am I to give anybody parenting advice? So so how did how did you overcome that hurdle where you're like, you know, me, Melinda, I am the person to write this book. <laughs> yes, it was, a, it was a struggle. I, 
Yeah. So for a long time, cause I wrote um, a slate parenting column for a long time and people would say, why don't you write a parenting book? And I always, I was like, no, I couldn't possibly write a parenting book that feels so like sanctimonious and obnoxious. And I don't know what I'm doing half the time. And I think, you know, honestly, like when everything felt like the, when the world felt like it was going to shit and I was thinking about just how important this was for me to, to know how to raise my own kids. I like, I felt this really, I've, I've just felt the desire to dig into the research myself, like for myself. And I mm. thought about it and I, and I, and, and talking with other parents, I was like, if I base the book on research and not my own ideas and opinions, you know, if I mm -hmm. really ground it in research and I'm good at, I know I'm, that's something I can do as a science yeah. journalist, I can read research and I can digest it and I can translate it. Um, and so if I grounded it in research, I felt like, okay, that, that puts me on firmer ground. And also mm -hmm. just, it just felt really pressing. Like it wasn't, this wasn't just like some parenting book saying like how to help your kids succeed. It felt like a, a book that could actually like make the world a better place in some way, mm -hmm. if enough, if enough people read it. And so then it, it just, it felt important and it felt like, okay, this is, I can overcome this, this discomfort I have and yeah. do this because I think, I think it will do some good. I hope, I don't know, but like, that was kind of what got me over. It was like, okay, this is important enough that I, that I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and I know, you know, this, cause I, I I've sang the praises of this book all over Twitter and stuff like that, but like, like work that you do in other science journalists, like, I think it's so important because I, I'm a huge nerd. Like I'm a college dropout who just happens to be really interested in psychology and science and philosophy and stuff. And, and I'm like, we need this to be more accessible to people. And that's something, you know, you did a wonderful job with. It's just breaking down the science. But I also think, and you know, this is me, you know, puffing you up a little, but I think you did a great job like achieving that goal where it didn't seem like you were talking at them and you shared, you shared enough personal experience with your own children and you like related it to the studies and talked about what you've noticed and seen improvements and things that you've tried and everything. So I think, I think that was mission accomplished, but since you've been writing, like, cause you've been doing these in articles, I'm curious, have you, have you had any parents like email you or reach out and like freak out, like because of what you wrote or what the science says or, or anything like that? Uh, you know, actually, in the past week or so, so an excerpt, uh, an adapted excerpt of my book ran in the New York Times this weekend, um, mm -hmm. all about talking to kids about race and why it's really important to talk to kids about race. Mm -hmm. And this is such an incendiary topic right now with oh, yeah. uh, critical race theory that I have definitely gotten several emails over the last like 72 <laughs> hours from, now I don't even know if they're parents, but they're very angry that I suggest that it's important to talk to kids about race. And I think that's just because it's caught up in this. Well, I, actually, I also know that the uh, Fox News Mm -hmm. um, ran a piece about my piece, you know, saying, can you believe this New York Times writer said this? And so yeah. that, of course, got all the trolls very excited. And so, yes, I, I've definitely gotten emails like that that are like this, what you're saying is ridiculous and it's going to harm your children and they're going to be ashamed for the rest of their lives that they're white and all this stuff. And um, but other than that, no, I haven't gotten a lot, I'm, you know, but the book hasn't come out yet officially yeah. till tomorrow. So, so, or, uh, you know, I don't know when this will air, but yeah. when we've recorded this, it, it won't, it won't, it's not out yet. So I might get some angry emails. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, no, that that's interesting. And I, I could go on about that forever. Something as, as an avid reader and just book addict, nothing drives me nuts more than people who hold these very strong opinions about books or excerpts or, you know, like you wrote an article just kind of like, you know, promoting the book and saying, Hey, here's something that we talk about. And you have an entire chapter on it, plus other chapters that build up to it. So yeah, I just wish I can grab people and say like, you're not allowed to say anything until you read <laughs> the actual book. You know what I mean? Right. But but uh, yeah, let's let's talk about that for a minute. I'm curious what your thoughts are. So, uh, I, even though I don't look it, I'm half black. So my son is a quarter black. You know what I mean? And it's something that I I look at, and you know, I I've seen just you know, especially through what happened in 2020. Like I I come from a very privileged position. Could you look at me? I've recently had people say I look like Middle Eastern or something like that. But I'm half black, half Italian, right? And so, but compared to an entire half of my family, I haven't had the experiences they have, right? And then my son, you know, he's even less. So like I think about this, and obviously he interacts with our family. So. Uh, you know, I, my experience is different. His experience is different because we've, we've been around it as part of our family. So in the chapter, like, 
can you kind of discuss like, you know, how, how we talk to kids about race and even, even these uh, incoming criticisms? Like I read your book and I don't think you're trying to shame kids from being white, you know, but what, how do we talk to kids about race? What's, what's the research say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, my chapter on race, I really, uh, it, it was in, in a way it was, um, address mostly to white parents, to be honest. And I think I said that at the outset of the chapter, because mm -hmm. I think a I'm white and um, I don't have the you know lived experience of people of color and, and how, and I don't feel comfortable telling uh, parents of color, like what they should be doing. So I was mostly writing to white parents also because they have the most to learn and the, they kind of get the most wrong. I mean, that's not, mm -hmm. I don't like to say wrong, but they, they have a lot to learn when it comes to talking to kids about race, because what the research, so, First, the research that has sort of observed parents um, and tried to understand like how how white parents tend to interact with their kids about race shows that essentially white parents just don't talk about it. There's mm -hmm. this um, there's this approach that they tend to use called colorblind parenting, which is kind of based on the idea that if we don't talk to our kids about race, maybe they won't see it, they won't notice it, they won't make a big deal of it, and therefore they won't develop any kind of you know racial. Um, racist beliefs. And that kind of makes sense on some level, like, okay, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. they just won't notice it. But the research very clearly shows that kids, even as young as babies, do see skin color, they see race, they notice it. So there's been, um, there was a study using babies three months old, and um, it, uh, they observed like, what uh, pictures of like they gave these babies pictures of, of different people of different skin colors and they observed that the babies liked looking at the faces of people mm -hmm. who shared their caregivers skin color and so they, they see it they notice it from a young age um, and so that idea that if we don't talk about race kids won't notice it that's not true but then the other problem is if if um, kids see race but their parents aren't talking to them about it kids are mm -hmm. like little detectives and they're always looking out in the world to see what, to figure out what matters. Um, so they are trying to figure out, you know, what social categories matter, what, you know, what are the big things in, in the world that they should be paying attention to? And they notice very quickly that there is a very salient racial hierarchy in our society. Um, so they, they notice things like the fact that there's only been one president who's been black. And they notice that, you know, generally speaking, a lot of white people have more, like there's more white politicians and more white people in prestigious jobs compared with people of color. And they see this playing out in the world. And if nobody is there to explain what's at the root of this hierarchy and, you know, to say, oh, this is really the result of, you know, so many years of systemic racism, mm -hmm. then the kids will, will make will come to their own conclusions basically. And the simplest conclusion you can make if you look at this hierarchy, the simplest conclusion that you can make if you're a kid is, well, maybe white people are just better in some way. Like maybe they're smarter. Maybe that's why they, you know, all of, all of the presidents except for one have been white. They're just like better people. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of come to these racist conclusions based on what they're seeing around them, unless we have adults there challenging that conclusion and saying mm -hmm. and explaining why the world looks the way it does. And so that is, that's why it's really important to be talking to kids about race. Now, one of the, I think one of the misunderstandings that some people have when they, like, for instance, read my New York Times article is they think that, you know, we need to be talking with kids every second of every day about right. race and then hitting them over the head with it and saying like, you're racist to your children. That's not what this is about. But it's, it's more like when you have opportunities and there are opportunities all the time, if you're actually paying attention to it, um, when you're watching TV shows with your kids and you see something like, for instance, um, I feel like so many shows, maybe it's getting better, but so many shows used to have the bad guy have darker skin and like a foreign mm -hmm. accent, you know, and, and the, the good guys are all white. And so you can see stuff like this playing out in TV shows and, and pause the show and say, gosh, what do you think that's all about? And what's that? And mm -hmm. talk to your kids about. So we should be, you know, using opportunities that arise um, to have conversations and to help our kids notice racism when they see it. And to, mm -hmm. you know, to also just explain like, why are there differences in skin color and talk about the mm -hmm. fact, you know, that there's, there's a chemical called melanin and people have different amounts depending on yeah. you know, where their ancestors lived and just like making it something that's not a taboo, scary topic. And that also contextualizes, you know, what, why the world looks the way it does.
Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. And it, it just, it drives me absolutely insane. Like weird side topic. So I, I often look at my own experience, right? And it just feels, it feels like so many people are just in denial. So just real quick, Chris is a kid's story, right? I had an alcoholic mom, dad raised me by himself. He worked all the time, TV, movies, they raised me, right? And, and Movies, I used to love rom-coms. I don't get to watch them as much because my girlfriend's not a huge fan of them. But anyways, I used to love rom-coms. It gave me an expectation of what love and relationships were like, right? Like, you know, and, and with watching them as an adult who's been through <laughs> who's been through therapy, I look at it and I'm just like, huh, that's not healthy. This isn't healthy. How'd you fall in love with somebody in a day before even knowing anything? You know, just all these things, right? But also I was watching, you know, uh, shows like Full House or Family Matters and, you know, and I had these expectations of what a family should look like, all these things. But anyways, those kind of molded me with these expectations. So when you talk about these subtle things in TV shows, right, and I'm not sure like the data on like, you know, darker skin and like accents and stuff like that, but, but like, we have to admit that there are these little things that mold us or even like you're talking about this, this kind of colorblindness and kids coming to their own conclusion. I love my son more than anything. I looked over because he's sleeping in the next room over there. But kids are kind of dumb, not their fault, right? They just have a <laughs> lack of development. You do an excellent job in the in the book too, explaining how the prefrontal cortex takes quite some time to develop. So they have very little impulse control and they will say some embarrassing stuff in public. So we want to have these conversations. But what I want to ask you next is like, why... Not even why, because I think I know why, but I want to know your thoughts or how you've even been doing it is getting through these uncomfortable conversations. Like, girl, you talk about not only race, but sexism, and then you finish it all up with all the sex talk and stuff like that. And like, yeah, so how how can us parents overcome that that awkwardness and and all that. What do you, do you psych yourself up? Do you like do jumping jacks <laughs> in your room before you go have one of these talks or what, what happens? Oh gosh, yeah, that, it's so true. I mean, I feel like one of the big themes in my book is we should be having these really awkward, difficult conversations about these topics that we don't wanna talk about with our kids. Like we should be doing more of it, but you're right. It's so hard because I think too, like we've often been raised in families um, by parents who didn't wanna talk about these things with us. So like from a young age, we've kind of like, just absorbed this idea that these are t these are these are conversations we don't have with our with kids. But um, yeah, it's really, really hard. Um, and I, I have found that it just gets easier like the more I do it. And so I just try to kind of bring things up regularly because the more I do, like the 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 easier it feels. I don't know. It's just, it's just like, I mean, it's, I know it's a cliche, like practice makes perfect. And there's no such thing as having like a perfect conversation with your kids. But when I first started talking about race, like I, in my book, I talked about how my daughter saw um, a picture in the newspaper that was related to George Floyd's death. And, and she asked me about it. And I was like, Oh boy, like, where do I start? How do I even have this conversation? Yeah. And I know I kind of fumbled my way through it and I tried my best to explain, but then, you know, that initial conversation was certainly not complete. And I, fumbled my, you know, I made mistakes and then like a few, but what was interesting was this like planted a seed in her. And then like the next day she started, she asked me a question about it again. And so she was kind of ruminating on it. And then when she asked the next question, I'd had a little time to mm. think more about what I'd said to her and how I might be able to frame things even better. And so then I was more ready that second time. And then, you know, it kind of, we had like a back and forth for weeks, maybe months even about this, these issues. And I found that like each time it got a little easier. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, you know, there are really great books for talking to kids about these issues. If like you really kind of don't know where to start, a great place is with, you know, children's books that you can read with your kids or books that, you know, if your kids are older that they can read on their own with mm -hmm. like with sex, because that is often really like you don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, Roby Harris is an author. She's written a series of books for kids of different ages um, mm -hmm. that talk all about like body parts and um, sex and consent and relationships. And they're really, really helpful because if nothing else, you can just like sit down and start reading it with your kid. And then that leads to, you know, that gives you the language and the framing and then that, but you know, you can mm -hmm. then with that, with that sort of like framework, it makes it a little easier to mm -hmm. have the conversations. So, and there's great books about talking to kids about race and, um, mm -hmm. and like gender issues, sexism, gender stereotypes, 
that's a, that's also just it's not a bad thing to rely on books. Yeah, yeah. I I, I can't remember which book it was I was reading. It was I might have been even Clean by David Sheff, and that's all about just like addiction and everything like that. But I, I the number one lesson I learned, and this was when my son was like four or five. It was not long after I got sober. Was just to have regular conversations with your kids. Like it. I, I feel like aside from my kid not being an asshole, if my son knows he could talk to me about literally anything, I think I, I've i done a half decent job. But like I've, I've had a lot of like cognitive psychologists on here. I've had, you know, conspiracy debunkers and everything. And something I'm really trying to do with my son is just teach him how to ask questions and think like, and you talk about this in the book, like if, if my son is, is watching something and it's just all men, I want him to ask why, like, why is it all men? Right. Mm -hmm. And if it's all, you know, white men ask why, if it's all feet, if it's all women, I want him to ask why, like no discrimination. I don't care what it, if it's all dogs ask why, you know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah. what I've noticed and kind of like, uh, I could definitely relate to your experience where you, you kind of planted that seed with your daughter and their, their wheels get turning. And that's what I've noticed with my son is that he starts to notice stuff. And now that he knows that that line of communication is open, he'll come back and tell me what he noticed and we'll have a conversation and it gets easier now I'll tell you this the sex thing has not gotten easier yet uh, <laughs> he's, he's 12 and uh his his first year of middle school was in the pandemic so now he's going into middle school and I think back to my middle school and I was just like oh god like what is what is going to happen but let's let's discuss that for a minute so you you have a son and a daughter correct yes that's right so misogyny and sexism is something that you talk about in there and you know uh my my son's a mama's boy so I think he's like pretty decent and he's he's very polite and everything like that and you know something that you just mentioned and something that you discuss in the book is consent right and you know I hear just horror stories about you know colleges and everything and like I'm, I'm curious if you get concerned about that too. And this, this, you know, this is a difficult nuanced conversation, but are you concerned about that kind of consent and perception thing with young men, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like, how do we talk to them about that? How do they, how do they make sure without I don't know, quote unquote, ruining the mood when they get to that age and everything like that. Like, what are the best ways to kind of talk about this and warning signs and of, of like, hey, maybe this is a time for you to bounce and get out of there. And, and right. uh, last thing I'll, I'll mention, last thing I'll mention, totally, totally curve, total curveball. I dated a lot of crazy women in my days too. So, <laughs> so, so these are all things that I, I think about, you know, with my son and everything like that. So right. what, what do we do? Yeah. It's so hard. I, you know, I feel like it is important to have these kinds of explicit conversations with kids about, you know, if, if you're dancing with a girl or you walk her home, that doesn't mean that you're entitled to anything else. Like those are really important, but I also think there's a lot of seeds like we can plant that are related to that issue. But when kids are younger, cause you know, it, it, I, my kid is 10 and he's not even thinking about kissing girls yet. So yeah. I, it would be really hard for me to say like, so, you know, <laughs> you I, like, he doesn't understand what, what, I feel like he's not even really able to understand what I would mean if I was trying to explain, like, I mean, I guess I, I could talk about like, you can't, you know, don't think that you can touch a girl or kiss her if she, that I could mm -hmm. certainly say that. But I also just like regularly am talking about gender stereotypes with my kids. So I think a lot of, a lot of the problems with boys feeling men sometimes feeling entitled to women in their bodies. It comes from the way that we differentiate women and men and boys and girls from a very young age. Like, so when we, I'm just trying to think about how to like even start this, it can start. <laughs> so from the time kids are babies, right? We are um, sending messages that boys and girls are very different. Mm -hmm. And so we are, you know, buying different toys for boys and buying different toys for girls and different clothes. And, um, and, and a lot of the time with girls too, I noticed this, I was visiting my parents last week and I was very, I was paying attention to the kinds of things they talked about with my son versus my daughter. And it's, mm. it, it, 
it's really interesting because they, they would talk about appearance with my daughter a lot. They would comment on how pretty she looked or on her outfit or on, you know, what her hair looked like all the time and never did that with my son. And with him, they would talk to him about um, sports and they would talk to him about math and they would talk to mm. him about like school. And, and so these things, these conversations that we're having with boys and girls from a young age are sending these messages that, you know, boys and girls are very different. And that doesn't seem like a huge problem in and of itself, but, um, Again, going back to what I was saying earlier about like kids being detectives, they also notice this hierarchy with boys and girls, like with men and women, they notice again, mm -hmm. that there's been no woman president and they've, they notice that men tend to have, you know, um, higher profile jobs than women. Um, and mm -hmm. they start to make these, uh, these, again, these conclusions about like maybe men are smarter or better. And so you're probably wondering, how does this relate to sex and consent? Well, what the research suggests is that ultimately these beliefs and gender stereotypes, these ideas that, you know, girls should look nice and their appearance matters a lot and boys are, you know, smart and capable and powerful. Mm. Um, those kind of, when kids get to be around 10, 12, these ideas start to become more sexualized. And the research suggests that boys start to sort of expect that girls are kind of there to look pretty and girls start to think this too like their job mm -hmm. is to look pretty and be like sex objects and that their bodies are almost there for the taking for boys like bo they start to create these ideas about sex that are rooted in these gender stereotypes ultimately and the research shows that boys who believe in all sorts of gender stereotypes not just sexualized ones but just gender stereotypes in general they are more likely than other boys to um, make co sexual comments about women to grab girls bodies to um and to to um perpetrate sexual assault so mm -hmm. there is this really interesting like trajectory and really worrying trajectory between like how much we differentiate boys and girls with how likely it is that boys are going to take advantage of women and going mm -hmm. to commit sexual assault. So I think, yes, we have, we need to have these explicit conversations with boys um, about, you know, the fact that they aren't entitled to do any, you know, th and that, and that consent in one situation doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. imply consent in another situation or later or another time. Um, we need to have those explicit conversations, but there's a lot we can be doing all along the way too, as we raise them to, you know, kind of, challenge gender stereotypes and make sure that, you know, we, we try not to differentiate boys and girls too much. That was a really long answer. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I loved it. And, and yeah, and I, I think about your book, like, uh, I know you read, you read my review of the book, like the only critique I had, which wasn't even really a critique because it all comes together so well, like a beautiful recipe, right? Is, is that there wasn't like a, a, an entire chapter dedicated to like mental health and addiction or whatever, but that's just me because, you know, that's like my thing. And I'm always, you know, making videos and writing books about mental health and stuff like that, but it all comes together. And, and as you were talking, I was thinking about it too, like, you, you have a whole chapter on, you know, how to raise kids who aren't selfish, right? And, and it feels like, for example, if I'm raising my kid, you know, to be polite and always ask permission and to not just take things without asking, if that's part of his foundation, I don't see him just randomly being with a girl and saying, you're my object, I could take that because he's learned to teach people equally so it all kind of like blends in mm -hmm. together and we we form these good habits in all situations so that way when they when it, it translates over and that's kind of what it feels like right so when i think about that like i i've never seen my kid just like well not in recent years but like snatch something from someone else so i'm pretty sure you know when he gets into those situations he'll be asking and and stuff like that but um to another point that you brought up like i i think that's a you know that's a that's a whole nother episode but like uh consent in one situation isn't consent in another and stuff like that and something i've done which i don't know if if you do this but we you know we watch shows and movies and stuff like that and i'll have conversations with them about the characters and what they did. And do you think this was right? Or do you think this was wrong? And and I think that's another way to kind of easily have these conversations. Uh, I, I can't remember if you touched on anything like that in the book, but is that something you've done or like have, have your kids like, you know, kind of get into the mind of the characters and what they might be thinking and all that kind of stuff? Yes, absolutely. That's a, it's a really good point. Um, we do this a lot and um, we do it with books too. It's funny because my daughter now is very, um, 
she notices like anything sexist in any like book or any show and she wants to talk to me about it. She's like, so we were reading, when we were visiting my parents, we were reading Grimm's fairy, um, yeah, Grimm's fairy tales, which are mm -hmm. so dark by the way, they're like, like the actual original Grimm's fairy tales. And yeah. there were all sorts of ones where like the, the husband, you know, orders his wife around and she, every time, you know, something like that happens, she'd be like, well, that's, that, that, that's not right. That's sexist. And we would talk about it and talk about like what it was, you know, what about it was sexist mm -hmm. and stuff. And yes, TV shows. I feel like any, any kind of movie that involves like high schoolers often has these often really disturbing messages about like consent and relationships mm -hmm. um, that you can talk about with kids. I was, uh, I went through a, a phase like during the pandemic when we couldn't leave our house i started showing the kids movies that i remember being watching when i was a kid like yeah, you know, movies from the 80s yep. and oh my god some of them are so disturbing though like we watched adventures and babysitting i don't know if oh you my remember god, that i wanted movie. to watch that with them okay I love, I well there's movie. a lot to talk about in that movie because <laughs> I, I of course had forgotten about all of this but the there's two like teenage boys in the movie and elizabeth shoe is the babysitter and so you know elizabeth shoe is attractive and th th these boys are constantly like doing very you know they're harassing her they're making sexual comments at one point another character falls asleep, a girl, a teenage girl falls asleep in a car. And the, one of the boys starts unbuttoning her blouse to like, basically the implication is he was going to assault her while she was sleeping. And then another, uh, the other character says like, stop doing that. But mm -hmm. it was just, I mean, there were all sorts of things that it was normalizing um, that was really, un, you know, unpleasant. And so shows, yeah, movies like that, you can pause and be like, wow, do you, what do you think about that? Like, what just happened there? Do you think that's okay? And mm -hmm. why not? Why or why not? And have, have these conversations. Yeah. 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 That's, that's definitely been, uh, one of the benefits of the pandemic is, you know, my son and I used to go to the movies all the time, like all the time. And now everything's streaming and everything like that, but we can pause and have conversations and stuff. And, you know, even when we're watching like scary movies where they just do really dumb stuff, like we'll pause and just talk about the ridiculous decisions they've made, you know, cause we right? talk about yes. the decision-making process yeah. and, and all that. And, um, Something that I, I, I'm I curious your thoughts about. So we're talking about, you know, like stuff like in the media or on TV and shows and stuff like that. And this kind of leads into just like this philosophy I have, which I've, I've eased up a bit on it. But I personally, I kind of blame everything on the parents. If a kid <laughs> grows up to be just an asshole, right? I blame the parents, right? And and I don't know, I'm a weirdo. Like I know all of like the trendy YouTubers. I know everything there is to know about like Logan Paul and all these other weird things happening and stuff. And something I've realized, and I'm, I'm sure you have through your research and stuff, like a lot of parents don't know. They don't know what's going on on YouTube. They don't know what's going on on TikTok. They don't, they just don't know. And sometimes I'll watch just dumb stuff that I think is ridiculous, but I feel it's important to know what they're watching. And like, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then we want to point the finger at the media or the YouTubers and everything, but I always bring it back to the parents. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know. Like, I would love for another parent to tell me if I'm just insane and know you make parents too responsible. Like how much responsibility is there on TV and YouTubers and what's in the media? Like, you know, it, it, you're very active in this thing and I try to be too, but where, where's that balance? Or are you like yeah. me and you think everything's the parents' fault? <laughs> If a kid grows up to be a serial killer, is it the parents' fault? Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's such a good question. And I certainly wrestled with this, like, throughout writing the oh, really? book because, yeah, because, you know, the title of the book implies that parents are responsible, you know, parents can control, basically, like, what their kids turn out to be, that it's really up to the parents to not raise assholes. But, I mean, I do think... And I make the point in the book, of course, there's um, so many things that shape like who a child becomes that are like, for instance, we don't, we're not there when they're at school and they're experiencing all sorts of things at school that are, you know, all those experiences are going to shape like, you know, who they become and what's and how they feel and mm -hmm. how they see the world and certainly like what they see on TV. Um, and of course, you know, kids have um, different like brains and, and neurotransmitters can be very different and, um, you know, a different like brain chemical balances will certainly shape behavior and um, genetics and all, all of these things certainly like play a role in who our kids become. Mm. Um, but, but there is, there is research suggesting that parents do they, they play a very important role and they do make a difference. Mm -hmm. And that's true even like when kids are teenagers and we think that they're not paying attention to us at all anymore. And it's all their friends who are shaping everything. Right. It, parents still still make a difference. But um, 
you know, and, and to your point though, I think that it also, how much of a difference parents make does depend on like how often we have these conversations. Like if, if, if we are not talking to kids about what they're seeing on the media and they're seeing all sorts of really bad examples, you know, playing out and they're seeing all sorts of things in TV shows that are, yeah, that are just sending like dangerous messages about consent or whatnot. Um, you know, if we don't challenge those, then I think that the media has a stronger impact on kids than if we were to, you know, say, explain mm -hmm. that the media sometimes portrays things in a way that, you know, isn't really right. And that, and I think when we have those conversations, we give them the tools to kind of um, contextualize what they're seeing and realize that, that they shouldn't trust everything they're seeing as the way the world should be or the way the world really is. Mm -hmm. um, that I think maybe minimize, like decreases the influence that the media will have on them. So, yeah. you know, I think it depends. It's, it's a hard question to answer yeah, and I could not find like a yeah. simple answer. It's it's definitely a difficult balance because something that you, you talk about in the book too a bit is, uh, you know, this kind of like, Hella, uh, helicopter parenting versus the free range parenting and stuff like that. And, and it is a balance because nobody as a kid wants their parents like all up in their business, checking everything and all right. that stuff, but we still need to monitor in a way. So like every now and then, you know, cause my son will be in his room. He watches YouTube, he plays video games and I'll, I'll just like kind of check in on him every now and then because he's gotten to the age where he's very independent. Like when kids are babies, you're like, oh, I can't wait for them to be more independent. So, you know, and, and then they start getting more independent. You're like, dang, I miss hanging out. But anyways, so I, yeah. I go in there and I'll check and stuff and like, uh, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's that balance of having conversations and uh, we don't even have enough time to dive into it too. But I think you, you know, uh, what, what you said can kind of, you know, be applied to this too, as, when it comes to teachers and schools, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have, I have a lot of friends who are teachers here in Las Vegas and things like that. And I think back to my schooling and I think about this and what, what teachers are required to do and required to teach. And, you know, there's so much of the, uh, we especially saw this conversation come up during the pandemic. Teachers are looked at as, you know, babysitters and, you know, and the way, the way I personally see it is, you know, they're there to educate my son about, you know, math, science, biology, all that regular stuff. And then it's my responsibility to kind of teach him about, you know, his mental health and, you know, uh, personal interactions, even though they learn that kind of stuff through school. But there's that balance too between what the school does and what parents do. So yes. here's something I've, we, we talked about it briefly in DM, but I just want to talk about it for a minute. You, you have a whole chapter on screen time and everything like that. So I want to talk a little bit about Gene Twangy's research. Um, so those who aren't familiar with Gene Twangy, and you could probably explain some of her work a little bit better than me, but there's this, there's this, you know, uh, our, our kids are being ra being raised to be little narcissists and screens are destroying them and depression rates are super high and addiction and suicide. And something I've noticed just through mental health research is that whatever your thing is, you'll blame it on that, right? Like, oh, <laughs> screens are this. Oh, but if your thing's like dieting, you'll be like, oh, fast food and sugar, that's what's making kids right. depressed and, you know, suicidal. But anyways, she, uh, and a lot of people point to a research and something I mentioned to you, you know, in, uh, in private was like, it seems like a lot of confirmation bias. Like it's 2021 now, uh, screens have been around for a while and it feels like we want something to blame. And I don't know if it's to like shuck responsibility from ourselves, but can you talk, you have a whole chapter on it and people need to get the book, but can you talk a little bit about what's the research say about screens and screen yeah. time and all that? Yeah, sure. I think it's, it's, it's such an important topic and parents have, I was out to dinner with friends last night and that was like the one thing they asked me, they were like, talk to me about what you say about screens. <laughs> so everybody, and especially after the pandemic, everybody has been relying on screens so much because you know we have to be working while our kids are at home with us. So yeah. um, I was, I, I was pleasantly surprised with what the research said about screens because I was very nervous. Like, am I ruining my kids by letting them, you know, watch their iPads a lot. Um, and, and so I, I dug into the research and it's really, I mean, for what, for one thing, it is really hard to interpret because, um, it's, you know, there, there's so many different ways that kids use screens. There's, they could be watching shows. They could be making videos. They could be creating things and being creative. They could be watching you know, um, something violent or they could be watching nature documentaries. And so mm -hmm. to lump it all together and say like, what just, mm. what do screens do to kids? It doesn't really help us because it, there's so many different ways kids can use screens. But 
Nevertheless, researchers have tried to sort of look at the relationship between how much kids use screens and what their well being is, their risk for, you know, ADHD and depression and anxiety. And what they have found really is that there's not a strong relationship between the two. Um, kids who use screens more really don't seem to be a lot more at risk for things like depression, anxiety, um, and other other issues that relate to their well being. Mm -hmm. um, and and so that's really reassuring. I mean, we need better research and, and it would be better if it was more granular and we could look at like the effects of, you know, specific things on well-being mm. and whatnot. But if you look at it on the whole, there's, there's not a lot, there's really no evidence that suggests that we should be terrified that screens are ruining our children. There really no. isn't. Um, and yet, yes, there's a lot. If you <laughs> just Google screens and kids and you see so much alarmist stuff out there and, mm -hmm. and Jean Twenge, her research is often cited in these pieces that are very alarmist. And even she wrote a piece for the Atlantic that was wildly popular. I can't remember how many years ago, um, are smartphones ruining a generation, I think was the title mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but it's really, if you dig into it, the, the claims that she makes don't seem supported by good research. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things I remember she was looking at like the year in which half of the population started owning smartphones. Yeah. And she said like, that was the year when um, kids well-being started dropping. So therefore it must be that phones are causing this. And that's <laughs> just like, no, we don't know that. There's so many things going on that could be, yeah. that could be responsible for this. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't think we need to be totally freaking out about screens ruining our kids. And also just, I mean, the other big take them from that chapter that I, I got. And this is what you were basically saying that you do with your kids. Like, yes, it's good to sort of keep track of what your kids are doing. Of course, it's good to keep track of what your kids are doing online, but also like have conversations and use media in a way with them. Like if they're interested in a new app or something like explore it with them mm -hmm. and learn with them, because all of those conversations you're having as you're doing the research together and you're learning how it works, like you're passing along your values and you're passing mm -hmm. along, you know, your concerns through those conversations and the research also just really shows that like having that sort of um, mentorship relationship with kids and screens and using screens with your kids leads to much better outcomes. Um, kids are less likely to, you know, be accessing porn. They're less likely to, um, to um, like bully cyber bully when parents and kids are using media together and like learning mm -hmm. about it together. So again, it comes down to like engaging with your kids on these topics that maybe you think you shouldn't, yeah. you know, that are hard to engage with your kids on, but it really makes a difference. Yeah. It's, you know what I was just saying? It's so hard not to brag about your kids because I don't want to be that parent. But uh, my, my son made the decision to delete TikTok. Right. He just yeah. saw, he just saw some of the stuff, you know, uh, he was on it for a while and we'd send each other funny videos and stuff like that, but he saw some things that he didn't like and, you know, comments and stuff and, and he deleted it. And I'm like, and he's only 12 and I'm like, wow, you know, and, and yeah, I love that you brought up just like the fact that screens are used for so many different things. Like imagine like, I can't imagine in 2019 being a parent that was like, screens are the devil, go outside and play. Don't touch screens. Right. Pandemic hits like here in Las Vegas schools shipped out like laptops and, or like little Chromebooks and stuff like that. And then I couldn't imagine my kid getting a, a, a computer that he doesn't know how to use, right? Mm -hmm. So we, I, I feel like there's also this, this issue where we don't realize how big of a part technology has become in our lives. I remember, I think it was eighth, seventh or eighth grade, I took a typing class. Like it was just like an elective in middle school. And I swear to God, it was one of the most important classes of my life because now I type like when I write like blogs or, you know, when I'm working on a book, I'm my, my fingers are on the home row keys and stuff like that. And I'm like, imagine if I never learned that. Right. And because I was like a computer nerd and learned how all these different programs work, like I've been able to get jobs because they're like, are you familiar with this? And it's like, yeah, just because I like to research and play around with things. So it depends on what the kids are using it for. But kind of my last thing on that too is, I think, you know, me as a parent, what I do is it's like, what, who do I want my kid to be? What kind of values and things like that? And there's times when I'm like, hey, you know, Dylan, do you want to like watch a movie or do you want to go to this place or whatever? He's like, no, I'm playing, you know, uh, not right now. Can we go in like 30 minutes? I'm playing with my friends. And I'm like, okay. So he's having social time with his friends during a pandemic. And I was an introvert 
who grew up as a gamer when the internet first came on. That's how I made 99% of my relationships. That's how I met you. And we're having this fantastic yes. conversation. So I, I've never been able to look at that and just be like, yep, screens are terrible. And, you know, uh, because for an introvert like me, the internet just opened me up to a whole new world, you know? So, so yeah, I think it's, it's very contextual. And, and, and like you, and like you said to like, uh, the, the, oh, when smartphones were released and stuff like that. Have you ever seen, you're a science writer. Have you ever come across like, I, there might be more than one website where it shows just like the most ridiculous correlations. Like, you could, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like those, you just yeah, match two those things. are so great. And uh, yeah, I had, I had like the author Stuart Ritchie on the podcast and he wrote science fictions and stuff. Have you read that? No, I haven't. Fantastic no, book. I need but, to. but yeah, I love reading books about how people manipulate data or do correlations mm -hmm. and stuff, but it helps me look at it better because I don't want to fall into confirmation bias where I'm just like, I, I believe this, now I see this and all that. But yeah. I have a little, a little bit more of your time. I wanted to talk about uh, just I, what I think is some of the most important research is uh, like Carol Dweck's work right mm -hmm. around fixed versus growth mindset and you dive deep into this and we could talk about this for hours but can you talk a little bit about how we talk to kids uh when it comes to praise and effort versus skill or innate mm -hmm. intelligence and you know oh you're a little genius or oh you did that on your first try and i i think i feel that that's one of the biggest issues and we don't even think about it can you talk a little bit about you know, let's dive into like the self-esteem aspect and intelligence and all that. What's, yes, what's, yes. What, what should okay. we do? Yeah, this is hard because I, I struggle with, <laughs> with this myself. And I find myself kind of doing the things that Carol Dweck recommends against all the time. And, and actually Carol Dweck also says like, she sometimes falls into this fixed mindset, mm -hmm. which is not the most constructive herself. And she's been researching this for like, I don't know how many decades, but a lot, yeah. <laughs> a lot of time. And so the idea, um, so there, when kids have what's called like a fixed mindset, it's this idea that um, ability and smarts, these are all things that kind of are innate and you're born with, you're either smart or you're not. You're either good at soccer or math or you're not. And um, and this is something that I think a lot of people think about, like as, even as adults, you know, you hear, I hear adults saying all the time, oh, I was just never good at math or whatever. Um, but this is kind of a, a dangerous mindset because it, it, yeah, it suggests that you can't do anything to change your um, ability or your skills in a particular area. You can't do anything to get smarter. But what the research really shows is that like, that's not the way, that's not how things work. If, mm -hmm. And even with IQ tests, there's some really interesting studies that suggest that, um, you know, kids, if they, they can have very different results on IQ tests, depending on how motivated they are during the test and how much effort they put into the test. Um, and so there's really interesting research on that, that even like IQ isn't fixed, it's related to the effort you put into the IQ test. Mm -hmm. um, so what this comes down to is the way we praise our kids can really shape whether they develop this fixed mindset or whether they develop what's called a growth mindset, which is when kids believe that, you know, the, the, the failure doesn't mean you're not good at something. It just means that you're just learning how to do it. And you're at the beginning of, mm -hmm. you know, developing your skill and that um, being challenged and finding something difficult doesn't, isn't a reflection of, you know, how good you are, how smart you are, but it just means that, you know, you're learning how to do something. You don't know, you know, you haven't mastered it yet. And so the way we praise our kids really matters. If we praise our kids by saying you're so smart or um, you're so good at math or you're so good at soccer, it kind of, it, it fosters this fixed mindset where they believe like, I can't do anything to change who I am. Mm -hmm. If we instead are praising kids for effort um, and saying, wow, you know, you tried so hard, you, you worked so hard on that and, and tying effort to outcome. So like if your kid does well on a particular test or in a particular game, instead of saying, oh, you're just naturally good at this, you say like, that must be because you practiced so much mm -hmm. last week, you got better and look at, you know, now you scored three goals and that's fantastic. And you're kind of tr tying the outcomes to the effort that your child put in. Mm -hmm. Then kids develop this growth mindset where they think of, um, they, they think of their skills as something, you know, that can grow over time and they just have to work on it. And this is both great for for fostering motivation and resilience. And it's also really important for self-esteem because um, kids who are praised for effort, they, they tend to believe like, that they are, they have more self-worth. They, they can do mm -hmm. more, you know, they, as long as they just 
work hard on something and really keep trying, they'll get better and better. Um, and, and so it's really interesting. Like it, it ties to both how much kids are willing to, um, how much effort they're willing mm -hmm. to put into their schoolwork and their hobbies and all these things, but also like their, their sense of self-worth goes up if you praise more for effort than for ability and smarts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you know, what's crazy. Let me tell you something crazy, Melinda. You know what I realized is that this is something that works on adults too and mm -hmm. how we talk to ourselves. You know what I mean? Like we need yeah. to remember that we can get better at something. And, you know, for example, like I, I read a ton and there's topics that I don't know that much about, but I'm like, well, I'll read five books on it and then I'll probably know a little bit more about it, you know, like, um, and it, it was, it was really important to me, uh, fun fact is one of the reasons this is called the rewired soul. It was originally called the rewire is because I learned about neuroplasticity, right? Mm -hmm. Because in my addiction and a lot of addicts and, you know, a lot of people with depression and things like that struggle with this, things are never going to get better. Things are never going to get changed. This is, this is who I am. And then when I learned the science, I'm like, oh, we can change. It takes work. Yep. It takes effort. And that's, that's something I've really tried to just pound into my son. I think a great example is, um, for the last year or two, we started cooking together. We try to, we, we find different recipes and everything like that. And uh, just an example off the top of my head, um, I'm vegetarian, He's, he eats meat, but he eats a lot of vegetarian stuff too. But we are trying to make this like, uh, uh, like orange chicken, right? And we keep screwing up the breading. So one day I was like, listen, we're gonna take like two hours. We're gonna look up like five different ways to bread these things and we're gonna try them all, right? And it took time, but then we found that one, right? And mm -hmm we got better at that specific cooking skill, you know? Right. So that's something I'm really always trying to, uh, you know, talk to them about. And let me ask you this, have you ever looked into the work or read the books from uh, Dr. Richard Wiseman? Like, have you heard of the book, The Luck Factor? No. no. Okay, so Tell check this out. I, you like you you mentioned this about your daughter earlier like when you like had a conversation with her about like uh, race or sexism and she like brought it up later. Like, mm -hmm. I'm always really surprised like, what sticks with kids. But I was telling my son about this study from the luck factor. I got really obsessed with this idea of like skill versus luck for a while, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they did research on this. And in one of the studies, they they gave people this like impossible puzzle, right? And you know, they do a little questionnaire to find out, do you perceive yourself as lucky or not? And what they found was, was that the people who perceive themselves as lucky, they didn't give up as quickly. They tried longer. Mm -hmm. I told my son about this study and he like told his uncle about it. He brings it up every now and then, but it's one of those things where like they, you know, uh, he, he, he realizes now that the harder you try or the longer you put in the effort, the more likely you are to get these outcomes that you're looking for. And these are things that mm -hmm. adults we could do in our lives and, and everything like that. But here's my question for you, Melinda. Okay. <laughs> because I feel honesty there, there's, there's a tricky balance between honesty and stuff like that, right? But let's say your son or daughter, even though I'm sure they are amazing artists, what if one of them just sucked at drawing, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I wanna be an artist when I grow up. I, I just wanna do this. Like, at what point do we talk to our <laughs> kids and say, <laughs> and we say, yeah. maybe this isn't your skill set because we want them to keep trying, but we don't yeah. wanna over inflate them. So right. have you run into that or what do we do? It is a, it is a balance. You're right. Because there, there's also a lot of research that I talk about on inflated praise. Like when we mm. tell our kids that, you know, like they, they draw a drawing and it's not great. And we nevertheless say like, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. That's called inflated praise. And that's not very good for kids. Actually, the research suggests that, especially with kids with low self-esteem, for whatever reason, if we inflate our praise, it's almost like they can see through They're like, I don't buy that. That's she's not, she's lying. And, and they actually decreases their self-esteem even mm. more. So I think we do have to be careful about, you know, we want to be encouraging and we want to be positive, but not like lying to our kids about their abilities either. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, it's so hard. I mean, my, my daughter is seven now and she's always loved drawing, but she's not nearly as good at, um, at it as some other kids her age. Cause I've seen, you know, I've seen their pictures compared to hers. <laughs> and so, but she's like, it's all she wants to do. And she just draws all the time. And the thing is, and so I, 
like I've never said to her, you're, you're really not very good at this or anything like that. Um, but I've certainly, you know, I've wondered like how honest I should be, but what I've noticed is cause she does do it all the time. Like this is her passion that she has recently gotten much, much better at it. Like I realized like, you know, she may have started out in a place where she was much, much worse. And mm-hmm. I worried that she would just stay much, much worse forever and ever and ever. But it could be also that like, there's a certain point in their development where they, something clicks and they get better at the thing that you didn't mm-hmm. expect. So, so that makes me think like, I'm, I'm really glad that I didn't um, discourage her from continuing to, you know, follow her passion. I mean, she's seven. Mm-hmm. So like in a way, like it doesn't matter if yeah. she's not deciding where, you know, to go to art school at this point or anything Yeah. She like might that. find a new passion next year. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I also, you know, I think, I think her being able to see that, I think she can tell that she's gotten a lot better. And a lot of it is because she just stuck with it and kept mm-hmm. doing it, even though like she started out not being very good. And I think that's a really great lesson to her, for her to absorb too, to see that, yes, you know, she's just gotten so much better and she can compare her drawings and Mm -hmm. see like she's come so far because she stuck with it. So I think it's really hard. I think you do want to be encouraging, but you don't want to basically like lie to your kids either, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And I think like, if my daughter asked me point blank, like, am I better drawer than, you know, this other kid who's clearly a better drawer, I probably wouldn't say like, yes, of course you are. I I would try to say, well, you're, you know, you have some really great skills. You can do this really well, Mm -hmm. but like this other person can draw faces maybe a little bit better than you. Maybe they've practiced a lot on that in particular. And so they've gotten really good at it. You know, I'll still try to frame it in terms of growth mindset. Like maybe she's Mm -hmm. just like really practiced this a lot. And that's, um, so it's like a, you want to be honest, but you still want to be encouraging, I think, but it's yeah. really tricky. Yeah. No. And, and, you know, I was, you know what I was just thinking about Melinda? I, I love, I love talking to people. And I love these conversations. Like I, I, like I get to think and reflect on, you know, this stuff with, uh, you know, my own son and everything. And, and yeah. And you just touched on, I, it goes back to like that growth mindset because, you know, I've, I've, you know, the work of like Anders Erickson and stuff like that, uh, where, you know, people, you know, uh, you know, they do deliberate at practice and all that and yeah I, these are things that i i because my son he gets really into drawing and he goes through like these phases and stuff but you know he'll he'll see where you know maybe the eyes need improvement so he can just keep practicing that but something else and this is something that i struggled with with my own self-esteem that i try to teach my son you know not to do is we compare ourselves to others right yeah. and where others are at today rather than where we were at yesterday so like yes. you're talking about with like your daughter like if she's improving dope that's what matters right but these other kids because what was it i think it was uh one of malcolm gladwell's books like outliers or something and it that was one of the books that just like opened my eyes like oh wait wait they're they're not a natural right like yeah. beethoven or you know mozart or whatever they were playing 10 hours a day since they were four. So I think that's another benefit of talking about this like growth mindset and working hard because when you look at other people, you realize that they didn't just come out of the womb as an amazing artist. Like they might just be doing that all day, all the time. Yes. So I, I have two more questions for you. And this is something that I, uh, the first one is if I ever decide to, you know, start doing blogs about parenting or write a book or, you know, whatever, are you ever worried because you you share some stories in this book. Are you ever worried that your kids are going to grow up and read this book and say, "What the hell, mom? What <laughs> like <laughs> like there's a like this there's a story in there, and I'm just going to give a teaser so everybody buys your book of uh, your son and a friend and an iPad, right? Yes, so are yes. you ever worried that they're going to grow up and be like, oh, what what <laughs> you know? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I do I do think about that, and you know I. It's so hard because I certainly talk to my kids about the book and I ask them mm. their consent to to talk about what, you know, what they've done and who they are and, and, but yet they're kids. So like, how much can they really consent? How much do they really understand yeah. what they're consenting to? Because they don't really understand what it means. Um, so, you know, I did try to talk with them a lot about, about what I was, you know, hoping to include. And I asked them for their consent multiple times and they kept saying, yes, it's totally fine. And I, you know, I don't know, like they could in 10 years be so angry at me for this. Um, And it may well, I mean, they'll probably be angry at me in 10 years for so many reasons, (laughs) but, um, but I also like, I did make the deliberate decision and, you know, who knows how much this of a difference this makes, but their names are not in the book. Like they're certainly, I say my son and my daughter throughout the book. 
of course, anybody who knows how to use Google can figure out who they are. But I felt like that was at least like one boundary that I didn't want to cross by, inc by including their actual names in mm. there. Um, but yeah, I do worry about this. And, and I, I worry that I'm going to regret having included all of this in the book. But I also... I don't know, you know, I think about like, if the book hadn't had any of my own experience as a parent, then also like, would any, would that be as good of a book? Would it be as relatable? Would it mm -hmm. be as, you know, in a way I wanted to share that, like, as the author of a book about not raising assholes, that my kids make mistakes too. And oh, yeah. I make mistakes and like, my kids aren't perfect. And this is, and that's just the way things are. So I kind of, I, I also felt like it was really important to have that there. So yeah, it's hard though. Who knows? You I don't know. I might I might regret it. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll see. And I, I think so much of a, uh, of parenting is, you know, because, you know, even that form of consent changes over time. Like, they, mm -hmm. you know, your kids might hit high school and start dating someone and they're like, oh, your mom's a writer and read this book. And they're like, oh, what'd you do? You know, whatever. And, yeah. uh, you know, it changes. And it's like, hey, we, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, especially with the way kids brains and bodies changes. And, you know, they get right. crazy during their teenage years. And, yeah, like my kid's 12 and I'm like, okay, I'm like, when's it, when's it going to happen? When are you, <laughs> when is that switch, you know, going to flip? But something that my mom kind of conditioned me for is she's embarrassed me with stories my whole life. So if she wrote a book, I'd be like, well, everybody already knows this because <laughs> my mom tells literally everybody I'll have a brand new girlfriend. And the first thing she says, is just the most embarrassing thing that I won't say publicly, but so last and final question. So this book when it blows up, when it takes off, which it's about to do, are you going to write or are you going to research or have you already started like how to raise teenagers who aren't assholes? Mm. Is this something that's already in the works in your mind? Have you thought about it? Because there's some changes and some different topics we yeah. got to discuss. That's right. That there really are. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm obviously not I don't know what it's like to launch a book because my book has not officially launched, but this whole process of writing it, um, I've loved, like I've really, really enjoyed it. And so I absolutely want to write another book. Um, I don't know exactly what it's going to be. It might well be that issue of like, basically how to raise ass kids who aren't assholes when they're older and dealing with all of the issues that happen in the teenage years, because I think there are not enough resources. I mean, there are some great writers in this space, um, but there aren't enough. I feel like there could be, mm -hmm. there could be a lot more books on supporting parents of teenagers. Cause I think it, it's just such a hard time to, to be a parent and, mm -hmm. um, and to know how to, how to engage with your kids and how to respond to them. So that certainly is one of that, that is a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but you know, I'm also like thinking about, is there anything else that I would want to write? That's a little, you know, is there a different aspect of parenting or even science? Cause I, I write a lot about parenting. I have in the last 10 years, but I also write about science and medicine. So I don't know if I might want to like pivot. Mm. Um, although I kind of, I'm really enjoying, I'm really enjoying being in the parenting space and I, I feel like it's rewarding and, and it's helpful to people. So I might stay in it. Yeah. And it might well be that you might just have given me my next book idea, Chris. <laughs> yes. The acknowledgement section, but yeah. It's oh yeah. That's, that's another thing I, I loved about your book. Like when I, when I got sober nine years ago and stuff, I'm like, oh my God, you know, cause my mom was an alcoholic until I was 20. And then like, you know, there's, there's things that, you know, uh, people in recovery, we have to keep working on even after we get sober, like all our problems and psychological issues don't just go away. So I started reading a ton of books, like the books from like, when I got into like mindfulness and meditation, but like five Daniel Siegel books and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, on brain development and all these things. But anyways, I've, I've dabbled in a couple other parenting books. And, and again, one of the reasons I, I loved your book and was obsessed with it is I feel a f in the parenting space, and maybe I just haven't read enough, but some of them dive, it, it's all into one topic right? Yeah. So it goes very deep, which is good in some senses. Uh, but in other times, it's very, it can be almost seem like bias or anecdotal. And your writing, like, this is what I love. You covered just the full gambit. Like I, like I mentioned, even though you didn't dive into like mental health and talking to your kids about drugs, so much of the stuff from other chapters could be applied, right? Mm -hmm. Because as a parent who talks to my son, like I've had him meditating since he was like five and stuff like that, right? And we talk about mental health and emotional well-being. There was so much stuff in various chapters of your book where I'm like, oh yeah, these are things that I've talked about with my son. Mm -hmm. And you know, the chapter on mm -hmm. self-esteem, that's good for mental health. So I think you do a great job with that. So like when I was reading, I'm like, okay, well, well, Melinda, what do I do now when my kid turns 13, 14 years old? I need another, I need another book. Yeah. I need you to go do all the research for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so that would be, that would be 
Awesome. But uh, but yeah, you you have a busy day and a busy week because we're recording this during your launch week. So book comes out tomorrow on the 20th at the time of recording this. Where, okay, so a few questions. Where can people get the book? Mm. Um, and where is the best place for people to find you since you are writing in between books? You write articles and stuff like that. Like people who just fell in love with you, where can they keep keep up with all your, your good stuff? Yes. Oh, thank you for asking that. So my book is for sale at any bookseller. You can buy it from your local indie bookstore. You can buy it from Amazon. Um, but I, and as far as finding me, I, cause I also write a parenting newsletter, a free parenting newsletter mm. called is my kid, the asshole, which every week I, um, or every other week, I should say it's every week, but every other week I address like a, a question from a parent about challenging kid behavior. Like why Ooh. does my kid freak out when I tell them to turn off the iPad? Like what's going on there? How can I help them? Um, so all of, but you can sign up for my newsletter and you can read my articles and you can actually get purchase links for the book by going on my website, which is Melinda Um, and so everything's there and, uh, yeah. And I update it with, you know, events that, that are upcoming as well. I have a launch event, uh, um, so several launch events coming up this week too if anybody wants to see more <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i feel no. like we covered so much ground here maybe not yeah and and you're, <laughs> and you're super active on you know social media twitter and instagram yes. so i will be linking that as well as long as the book oh. another question for you is will your book be available in audio format oh yes yes i just actually recorded it uh, a few weeks ago and that was that was amazing that was i've never done anything like that that was really fun um so yes it will it is going to be available starting tomorrow in audio format as well yeah and there's yeah. an ebook too i am an audio listener and you were so kind i put a nice little like extra thing like melinda is a nice gal like where you because you 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 went out of your way to get me an audio copy and i i listened to that thing and, and loved it and you narrated it yourself right yes Yes, I, I love yeah. when authors do that. But anyways, yeah, so hopefully everybody gets it and all that stuff. And I didn't even realize you have a newsletter. So now I get to sign up and see if my kid's an asshole. Um, so <laughs> I can't wait to do that. So thank you so much for Melinda and best of luck during this oh launch. Thank you so much, Chris. This was really fun. Thanks for having me.